Now, we were just treated to that extremely funny uh, little footage there of Curb Your Enthusiasm. So why don't we start by telling the audience how you got to be Susie Green. Hey. <laughs> you know, first let me just say that the first clip where Larry comes to the house and I, I, I hit him in the chest, he does yeah. that. That clip took about, I would say, about 25 takes. Because every time I hit him, he kept on saying, hit me harder, hit me harder. And he would giggle. Uh -huh. He would get hysterical. And so by the end, I had like, my knuckles were all bloody. I was <laughs> dripping blood. That's what happens on Curb. Um, how did I get the job? OK, we knew Larry way back when. Yeah. When did we meet him? 1986, 85, uh, something like that? I think even earlier. Than, okay. Probably 83 or 4. We met Larry when we were both stand-up comics at Catch a Rising Star, and Larry was a legendary comic. He had been on Fridays. He had been on Fridays, yeah. and he was a great comic. Yes. But he yeah. was like a little, um, how, well, how would you describe it, Joy? Uh, he was a curmudgeon. He was a curmudgeon. <laughs> he would do things like he would get up on stage, and if he looked at you and looked at this lady right here, and for some reason didn't like the way you looked, he would just say, never mind, and then he'd walk off. Or if you, looked at, or if you just looked at your watch during the middle of one of his sets, he would, he would, he would turn like, on you. He would freak out and then just walk off. He felt rejected very, he was sensitive, really. Yeah, he was very yeah. sensitive. Mm -hmm. so, um, <laughs> so anyway, so we knew Larry from way back yeah. when, and then uh, I didn't see him for many, many years. And Larry was actually, in 1987, was the head writer for your talk show you had, yes. Way Off Broadway yes, on Lifetime. Yes, he, so he wrote for me, yeah. He, and then we got to know him a little better during that time, so we'd hang out with him. Right. And then I didn't see him for many, many years. He moved to L.A., he got <coughs> married, he played golf every day, and we had nothing in common anymore. And um, <laughs> then he did the special of The Curb, the, the pilot, which right. was actually a special. In it, Jeff's cheating on me. But there is no uh, Susie, there's just Jeff's wife that he's cheating on me. And he had this episode in mind in season one where the fresh air fried kid robs us blind. Yeah. Is this annoying how it's echoey? No, I don't okay, care. Okay, because it's annoying me. And so he had an idea that he wanted to get somebody who was going to be able to, his direction for me for that was rip Jeff a new asshole. So he saw me on the Friars Roast of Jerry Stiller ripping all of that whole day as a new asshole. So then he gave me the job. Is that it? That's like a long, boring, complicated No, it's not boring, because it just uh, the point being that you have to show up at things in order to get a job. That's and, what and, she and did. And actually, I think the most important <clears throat> part of that story is the fact that we had been Friars for a while and really had to prove ourselves with those old boys oh, at yeah. the Friars Club. That was, I talk about a boys' club. That was a boys' club. And, um, you know, we did, Joy and I just kept on, like, showing up and showing up and doing our work and, and, and making our bones and making our bones and... and paying our dues, and then Comedy Central didn't want me on that roast. Why not? I wasn't their demographic. I was too Jewish, too female, too, too Jewish. old, too For whatever. Comedy I Central? I don't know what it was. They didn't, I was just not their, <laughs> their demographic is young male, and they just saw me as some old female. Female is the key. And yeah. they didn't want me on. The Friars Club fought to have me on uh -huh. that roast, which and, I proceeded to. And because to, of that, you because have Because of this that, I have job. this job. Exactly. Right. Which nobody is quite like you. That roast, which I love, which my first line was, I said to Alan King, Alan, do you ever think you'd live so long that your prostate would be as big as your ego? <laughs> <laughs> Alan King, he loved it. And then, <laughs> and then Maury Povich was on the dais, and, and I said to Maury, um, Maury, we always wondered why you married Connie Chung, and then I realized we all know Jews love to eat Chinese. <laughs> Whoa. A little, little rough for this crowd. <laughs> That's the Friars Club, you know? You have to the take roast. the punches. You know, yeah. the thing with the roast, and Joy, by the way, was the first female roast master in, what, 93 years? Yeah, 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 I think they, right, it was about 93 years. Uh, 93 years, <laughs> she was the first female roast. Uh, women weren't even allowed on the dais until 1990. No, Phyllis Diller had crashed a, ro a, lo a roast dressed as a man, and they didn't know she was a man. They, th they really, I mean, they didn't know she was a woman. Yeah. They thought she was really a man, and that was the only way she could get in, and she sat there the whole time. But that was all because it was, it was a boys' club, and it was, you had to be filthy, and it was all about the language, and... And we had to come out there and prove ourselves right. that we could be just as fucking filthy as them. <laughs> and we and were. We were. <laughs> and we were. 
I uh, remember the Danny Aiello roast because um, you were the roast man. I was the roast master, but Richard Belzer for his his thing that he did against Danny was not just jokes. He got up and read. Uh, reviews that Danny had gotten for this show called Della Ventura, which were the worst scathing. reviews, scathing, scathing reviews, and he just kept reading the reviews and how bad he was, and and Danny had not heard the reviews, he, and he started to cry. It yeah. was really great. He started it was to great. cry. It was one of the and, best and, times. And it was it was hilarious because <laughs> and, because we're both on the dais and the cameras on us, and both of us were just looking straight forward when he started to cry because we couldn't look. We looked at each other. We were going to get the giggles. <laughs> I think. Oh, so good. Um, so this book is very interesting because you have a lot of things in here that I don't think people know about you. And uh, we won't give it all away because we want them to buy the yes, book. Yes, many copies. But it's very well Hanukkah. written. Hanukkah. It's very well written. <laughs> it's a great Hanukkah gift. Yes, it oh, is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, for instance, um, tell them about how you prayed for lesbianism to strike you. Well, as you know, <laughs> I went out with many assholes in my time. <laughs> and I mean, you lived through it with yes. me for 25 years. Well, I met Jimmy. It, it, we, we're coming on our sixth year meeting anniversary. So for, for Remember the one we called Caravaggio? Yeah, for 19 years. <laughs> Why did looked, we call him Caravaggio? Because he had that look. He looked like a Caravaggio <laughs> painting. He was very pretty, but not nice. So, um, <laughs> Jewish, but... Um, <laughs> were they all Jewish? No, most of them were not. Well, Jay was Jewish. Yes, he was. And well, Marty was Jewish. Yes. Let's and, not name names. All right. No. <laughs> Are they here? Jimmy is not. Jimmy, Jimmy my husband, is not Jewish. She married a Gentile. Finish the basement. Enough said. <laughs> so. Okay. Now, I'm not an idiot, okay? He's not allowed to take care of my money or my career. I have a Jewish accountant, Harvey, I believe, is here, Jewish manager, Jewish lawyer, Jewish agent, but husband. He's good. He's good. He's, he's good. He's got that honeydew list. He's the best. <laughs> best there is. You know, one of the, the things that I always regretted is that my, my father died in 2001, and I met Jimmy in 2003, and my father would have had him lists beyond lists of fixing every goddamn thing in his house. He would have been so happy to have him as a son-in-law. Why? Would, do you think he would have liked Jimmy uh, as yeah, a son-in-law? Yeah, who doesn't like Jimmy? Well, I know. He's very yeah. likable. But would your father have preferred you to marry a Jewish guy? I don't think he cared about that, as long as he would fix things. That, that was the, the priority. <laughs> How about your mother? Would she have liked a Jewish my guy? My mother loves, my mother says to me all the time, you got so lucky with that Jimmy. <laughs> What about how fucking lucky Jimmy got with me? You know? You got so lucky with that Jimmy. Because he's such an Eddie Haskell with her. Yeah. You know, he calls her on Rosh Hashanah. Oh, Happy New Year, Zora. He calls her on her birthday. You know, it makes me nauseous. It turns my stomach. You don't want your mother to be happy. Okay, so... Wait, what were we talking about before? Oh, the lesbianism. Yeah, the lesbianism. So when I was single... I went, I went out with a lot of, what was I thinking all those years? You know, sometimes I wonder if I wasn't purposely choosing inappropriate people because I didn't want to get married and have kids. I wanted to focus on my career. If it was an unconscious kind of thing. That could be, but you still could have picked boring guys instead of destructive ones. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Jimmy's not boring, but he does, do, he does tell long <laughs> so he does, he, he, he'll tell t way too many details, he's in uh, commercial real estate, way too many de details about like a loading dock and an escrow and you know, so you just want to like the, gust the mustard gas effect is taking, so now I have a thing with him where I just say, glazing, <laughs> which is shorthand for my eyes are glazing over, which is shorthand for you're boring the shit out of me. <laughs> but you see, we're the same like that, we have no patience. Salient points, punchline. Get to the point. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell them about Jimmy. Uh, Susie and Jimmy were at my house uh, about a year ago. This was maybe a Christmas party. And um, she, she, he was talking a little bit, you know, and she kept answering for him. So someone would say to him, you know, How, how's the weather? It's fine. <laughs> You know, and she just kept telling, he'd say, well, I'm going to tell you a little story. And then she would tell the story. So later I called her up and I said, listen, you have to let the guy talk. So she said, Jimmy, <laughs> Joyce says, I'm not letting you tell the story. And he said, oh, well, you tell it better. And I said, you talk about lucking out with the perfect guy for you. What man says that? You do the story better. Well, I happen to. 
I know you did. <laughs> I know you do. But very few men will actually admit that. He doesn't have an ego I issue. I also think that, that, Joy, one of the, the re, for me, one of the things that took me so long to meet the right guy is, well, first of all, he had never seen, he didn't have HBO, he didn't even have cable when I first met him, so he had never seen Susie Green. And he does admit that if he had seen her, uh, he doesn't know. <laughs> but the other thing is, is that, you know, it's for, to, to do what we do as stand-up comics, I really needed a secure guy, a really secure guy. Right. And it wasn't that easy to find. I mean, you did with Steve, but yeah, actually done. you met Steve before you started right. to I never do. even told him I was a comedian for over a year because I thought it would scare him. And yeah. then, then I had to eventually tell him, because you worry about them that they're just going to freak out by seeing you up there like such a ball buster. It's terrible. Yeah, it is. It is. But now Steve <laughs> loves it and Jimmy loves it. Yeah. So anyway, so I went out with a lot of assholes, and I used to pray for lesbianism to strike me because I thought it would be so much better to be with a woman as a love object. But you know better now that that would no, not be- I could be barely the... swim, let alone dive. I couldn't, <laughs> it wasn't for me. But you also <laughs> know that you would have probably been attracted to destructive women, the That's same right. as men. It That's doesn't have to do with correct. the gender. Absolutely correct. All right, so, um, so let's go back a little bit. So, so now you're um, dating all these, these jerks. Yeah. And uh, did you go into therapy? Yes. Well, I went into therapy before I did the stand-up. I went into therapy. Um, I love you asking me questions that you know the answers to. I went into therapy. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons why we've been such good friends all these years is because we both have a psychoanalytic bent. Yeah. And I think that that's been the key to our, that why when we first started doing this, we used to be on the phone, and I'm not exaggerating. Four or five hours a day. Yeah, but we would talk a lot of business, too. We'd talk a lot of business, and it was so hard for us in the beginning. And not just as women, as comedians, for anybody, it's Tell really, really hard. Tell them why it was so hard. You're up there all by yourself. You're not famous. Nobody's coming to see you. You have to win an audience over. You have to make them laugh. There are so many variables out of your control. You're dealing with so much bullshit in the business and other comedians and competitiveness and club owners. You're dealing with, with, with drunks. You're on at 4 o'clock in the morning with three people. You're getting the check spot, which is you get the spot when the check goes down and you have to keep their attention. There's just like so many different... You know, and you're bearing your soul. You're up there all by yourself, bearing your soul. You're saying to people, I think this is funny. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very vulnerable place to be. And it's just, it just knocks you down. That's why Larry would get off the stage. Yeah. He, he didn't, he he didn't have it. that thing. Well, no, we were desperate. He actually uh, worked at Fridays. He, he was a good writer. He right. had other ways to go, I think. But I, I couldn't. I had nothing else I could. I exhausted everything. I worked in mental hospitals. Right. Which I always say prepared me to be on The View. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. So, That's the truth, baby. Another story. Okay, so I graduated from college. I was an urban studies major. I always wanted to be an actress. I was, when I was little, I performed all the time. I used to stand up on the kitchen table and do both parts of the 2,000-year-old man album. Um, I was Carl and Mel. <laughs> um, and I would, you know, stand up on the kitchen counter and, and, and make up commercials and always doing sketches with my sister and all that kind of stuff. And then when I went, into, uh, I, I hit puberty, totally self-conscious, gave all of that up, just, you know, cared about what boys thought of me, shut up, was only funny with my girlfriends. See, now this is where I think boys differ from girls, because I have a feeling that all the boy comedians continued to be funny and everybody thought it was just great into And got all the girls because of it. And the girls liked it, but the boys did not like a funny girl. That's right. So we had to really uh, tone Put down. Put a lid on it. I think you yeah. were very fortunate that you went to an all-girls high school. I did. Uh, I think that, that, that... Yeah, because the lesbian, it was like a lesbian high school. No, seriously. They Lesbo were low high. It was Lesbo high. <laughs> and, the, you know, we were, I was just myself there. But then right. college, I started to clamp down on myself. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it, uh, the, what, is, what was that book that was out of few, the Ophelia syndrome or something? It oh, happens. Yeah. I see it. I have these teenage girls now with this self consciousness and this, and this, you know, the boys were the ones that were supposed to be funny. Now, with my girlfriends, I was still funny. Right. And, but I just kind of shut that part of me down, and it took me years to get that back, I think, years. Well, the, in your 20s. In my 20s, yeah. but first I, had, I went through a deep, deep, deep suicidal depression before yes. I got back to it. And it was when I was in such a depression that I started psychoanalysis. 
and started, you know, coming out of it. And it was the stand-up. I started the psychoanalysis, and I started the stand-up at the same, pretty much around the same time, within a few months of each other. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I could have done the stand-up without the analysis. No, because we're not from that group. You know, in Karen Horney's book, um, Neurosis and Human Growth, she talks about two different types, the self-effacing types and the, um, I guess, the aggrandizing types. And the aggrand people, like their business is loaded with aggrandizing males who would never think of getting into therapy because they think it will kill their creativity. But the self-effacing type yeah. needs to get out of the skin and into the, and get close to who easy. they are. So we had to have therapy. Now, we used to see this all the time. We would work in, work in the clubs in these showcase, showcase clubs, by the way, and I, and I have whole chapters about the stand-up world in the 80s, which was a, a big, you know, it was like the rock and roll of the 80s. I have a couple chapters about it in the book, um, and people seem to find it interesting. Um, <laughs> but th we would be at these clubs, and some mediocre guy would be up on the stage, right? And they would be dying a death, right. and they'd walk off and just say, I killed, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And the two of us would go out and do great and come off that, this joke didn't work, and it wasn't they good enough, us, and they hated us. They hated us. There was it one was, woman there who didn't who laugh. Laugh, it, it was, you know, and, and you always felt, I remember one night I was on stage at Cats Rising Story, and there was a guy, he had his back to me. And that was, I was incensed that this guy had his back to me, and I just went after him. Turns out he was blind. There was a seeing-eye dog <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Is that and then you have to get the funny. audience back because then, then it's like, oh, fuck me. Now I'm the bad person against the <laughs> blind guy and I look like the idiot. So then you have to like turn yourself in. There's so much technique like that yeah, that hard. you don't know in the beginning. Now, when I first saw Joy, you were always hilariously funny. No, you, you always were. You were yeah, always naturally funny. Yeah, I was funny, but funny. to be funny on stage is a like different that thing. is a whole different thing. There's yeah. so much technique that goes oh, into God. being funny on stage. And in the beginning, there's no possible way to have it. Yeah. You, well, you, you need to have a certain amount of denial in the beginning. That's why when the boy comedians would get off the stage, and they would be mediocre, you'd say, how, how, did, you, how did you do? And they'd go, well, I, I had a good time. Well, I'm glad you did, because no one else, else did. did. Yeah. <laughs> You know, or, or they'd be like, yeah, I was did very good. You know, they believed it so that they could get up again. If you're self-critical, it, it used to take me six months to get back on stage in, in the, the beginning. In the very beginning. Even when I did well. But then after a while, we were just doing it all the time. Well, then, you know, the whole secret of, of this particular craft is, is to do it over and over and over, over and, and over and over, over again. again. I mean, thousands and thousands of times. Which I didn't know at first. I used to think, oh, I'd have a killer set. And then I'd say, okay, now my career is going to work for me. No. Yeah, no. no it take, and, and I mean, it takes so many years to even find out who you are on stage. It just takes years and years to not even consciously hone your persona, just to feel comfortable in your skin and know, and just there's just so much technique that becomes unconscious that you don't even know you even have. Well, Susie's metamorphosis, your, your metamorphosis was that you were characters in the beginning. That's right. All different characters. I never spoke in my own voice. <clears throat> no, but that was a safeguard for you. Like Phyllis Diller had to wear crazy outfits. Right. Um, uh, and then you, this, when did you t turn into yourself? There was a time on stage? When, when we first met at a place called Comedy U on University and uh, 13th Street, which is this great little downtown <laughs> club um, with great owners, Paul Herzog and Bert Levitt, who loved both of us and, and liked female comics and gave us all lots of stage time. Gave us a special night. It was Thursday night. Yeah. Um, and so the, for the first six months, <coughs> that was the only place I worked. And after a few months, I remember thinking, all right, this is not, if I'm going to move uptown and go to the uptown clubs where you had to eventually go for your career, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to figure out who I am on stage. So I said to Paul and Bert one night, can I MC? Because I thought that would be uh -huh. a way. And they were like, you can't MC, you do characters, mm -hmm. you never speak. I was like, I know, but let me just try. I got up on stage and I said to the guy in the audience, where are you from? He said, Texas. And I said, oh. <laughs> 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 and that was, you know, but then eventually I said, let me try again. And, you know, you, you have to be willing to be bad. And I was, you, you know, you have to be willing to be bad. People don't realize how long it took you to get to this point. It's a long time. It's a long time. It's yeah. a lot of work. Okay. And also, um, let's see, we went to the, yeah. Oh, now you say in your book, this is a funny part of your book about how do you know if your husband is gay? Now, well, you know what's interesting? Just tips. Well, I have a chapter called Gay, Not Gay, Should Be Gay. Because I can't tell you how many times, I mean, you know this, how many times have we met somebody and you assume they're gay, then all of a sudden they're telling you about the wife and kids, and you're like, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> Can't 
can't you see? And they're all over Hollywood, <laughs> these guys, more than even in New York. And tell them about the picture frames. Well, that you could, they say that you could tell what a guy's like if he's gay. You could tell what if a guy's gay <laughs> if the picture of the wife and kids are facing out, he's gay. If they're facing in, he's straight. I say if the picture of the wife and kids are facing the picture of Mario Lopez and Brad Pitt, he's definitely gay. <laughs> but what, what do you think is this? That's an interesting thing to say. Why, why, so in other words, when he's straight, he really does He feel, looks at the wife and kids. If he's gay, he's like, look, look, I have a wife and kids. Look, I'm, I'm straight. Look, I'm it's so, straight. It's uh -huh. so interesting to me in this day and age that that's the case, especially in show business. Well, I think that it's still difficult for gays to come out in the business. Uh, obviously. Yeah. Um, so what are the cl other clues? The clues? Yeah. Um, you find him blowing the neighbor is one clue. <laughs> that's, um, a, that's a big one. That's a good one. That's a big one. Um, he reads my book. Although according to, uh, <laughs> according to Gore Vidal, who was here last week, I saw him, and he was on my show too, he believes that there are no such thing, uh, there's no such thing as homosexuals, only homosexual acts. So that if, you're, if the guy is just blowing the guy once, that does not make him homosexual, according to Gore Vidal. It's Gore just Vidal an act. Gore Vidal is a brilliant man, but he's wrong about this. Because if Jimmy blows a guy... He's gay. Exactly. <laughs> and he's out. <laughs> you know, you're speaking about how long it took, Joy should have had her own show like about 25 years ago. But the truth is... Whatever it took you to get to this point that you have it now is the right time. Well, it was a lot of that pr uh, practice that I had at the 92nd Street Y. I'd like to acknowledge the place because they invited me to do these interviews all the time, and I actually got very good practice here. So, I, you know, it, it's something that I really like doing. Okay, let's not talk about me. Okay, I don't want to talk about me. Now, you know, now the, the people don't know that you have a house up in Albany or right. near Albany. Yeah. And that she is, at the weekends, she is a suburban mother in, like, in a little town outside of Albany. Right. Now, people do see Curb Enthusiasm up there, don't they? Yes. Okay. What do they think of you when they see you in the supermarket? In the price chopper? <laughs> yeah. First of all, you know, it's like, what is she doing up here is the first thing they well, probably first, say. Well, first, this is what they do. For a couple, they do a couple different things. I was at a party recently, and a woman said to me, you know, you look just like that woman up there uh, mm -hmm. from Curb Your Enthusiasm. I am her. No, you're not. <laughs> I said, no, I am. No, you're not. Okay, fine, I'm not. You, you know, I'm not spending my time convincing you of who I am. <laughs> then the other thing that they do is they just like, they, they just like stare and they just, their mouth is, they, they can't believe that. It's different when you see somebody in New York. Yeah. Or, you know, in, in Hollywood or something. Or the Hamptons. Or the Hamptons, yes. <laughs> um, they, they just, they're, they're befuddled. <laughs> They're just totally befuddled. How about the family, Jimmy's family? How are they accepting of you as a uh, TV person? Um, some of them are fine. Uh, some of them are just a little hostile. <laughs> and some of them are, are just confused. They're confused. Like I remember once his sister said to me, she saw me on Law and & Order. None of them have cable. <laughs> okay? So she saw me on Law and & Order and she was like, <laughs> it, it was so confusing to me because it was you, but then you were on Law and Order. It's called acting. <laughs> but I think it's confusing. You know, people get really confused by Curb in general. People get really confused by Curb in general because in Curb... <laughs> ...voices. There no, we go. They're back. They're back. Um, so Larry David plays Larry David. Yeah. You know, and Susie... Well, an exaggerated version. But, but his yeah. name is Larry David. That's right. And Susie, Jeff, and Cheryl all have the same first names, even though different last names. And, you know, Richard Lewis is on, and Ted Danson is on. And, and they play themselves. And they play themselves. Yeah. But really, Ted Danson is not playing Ted Danson. He's playing Ted Danson, playing Ted Danson yeah. on Curb. None of us are who we are. The only one who is actually like his character, who he is, is Richard Lewis. Everybody else... Now, that's frightening. <laughs> Isn't that true, though? <laughs> Everybody else is not like that. No, I'm not I'm kidding. Neither yeah. is Richard. But we're yeah. all playing... So people think that Curb is real because it's people, real people. But remember, like, when William Holden used to be on Lucy? Yes. That wasn't really how William Holden really acted in real life. That's right. That's a good, well, that's a good point. So, so they, they kind of don't really 100% get it. Well, they should get cable. Why don't they have cable? So some people do. His family, eh, it's, it's a Catholic thing. I don't know. <laughs> I know plenty of priests who have cable. <laughs> 
No, they have pay-per-view joy. <laughs> so how about your mom, your mother? Now, your daddy, your daddy is gone. Yes. Dr. Lenny. Yes. Uh, who, uh, tell us about Dr. Lenny and his influence on you, because I know that you're a sports maven because of him. Yeah, well, so I, at the Chapter 7, I left my heart in the Bronx, which... Um, <laughs> I'm very nervous. Um, anyway, uh, I have a whole chapter about uh, my relationship with my father. My grandparents lived on Jerome Avenue, right across from the stadium. And um, if you get an applaud for an avenue in the Bronx, you know? How it's pathetic sad. is it's that? Sad. Yeah, it's pathetic. Go live there now, you like it so much. <laughs> so. Believe me, they won't. <laughs> So uh, my, the, my father was a, um, my father was an interesting man, a, you know, very, very smart and, and, and he had an interesting background. It's all in that chapter about how he became a doctor, never graduated high school, became a doctor, you know. Uh, one how of did he become a doctor? He never graduated high school. One of those stories, you know, one of those stories of the, the child of immigrants who, you know, the things that happened to so but many But did people. he go to medical school? He went to medical school. Because he went to <laughs> Because he did diagnose me. No, once. he was a podiatrist faking doctorhood. Um, no, he, no, he went, was no, an internist. Uh, no, he right? was an internist with a subspecialty in oncology. He he was kicked out of high school. He went to Stuyvesant and, and he flunked. He didn't flunk out. He was kicked out because he never went. Oh. But he was the kind of guy that would go to the library and study. Uh -huh. You know, he wasn't home watching TV. They didn't have TV in those days. <laughs> so he was, you know, he was an intellectual, but he found school boring. So he was kicked out of high school. Then he was drafted in the army, and his IQ test was very high. So they took him out of, and they said, "We're going to put you through a program of pre-med and see how you do. And then if you do well, well." So he went to pre-med for like I don't know six months, and then they sent him to medical school. Really? He never went to college. He sent him to <laughs> medical school. And he became a doctor. Does that happen often? Well, how the hell do I know? They had certain programs during yeah. World War II where they were taking they were just like engineers. Jump. And because they were, I think they were afraid that, you know, all this whole generation was going to be dead. I mean, you right, know what I mean? So right. they, were, they were making sure that people had whatever. So he, so he was interesting in that way that he never, he wasn't your typical doctor, business head kind right. of doctor. But he was not somebody, the background that he came from was a very emotionally um, reticent kind of, uh, his mother was not an emotional person. His father was kind of like an idiot savant in a certain way. And, and I'm not saying that kidding. He really was, he was kind of, they said he got hit on the head when he was a kid and he was not the brightest. But um, my grandmother used to, he, my grandfather, this is the beautiful marriage they had. My grandfather was a twin and, and the twin died in infancy, and my grandmother used to say, the wrong twin died, Izzy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had one of those marriage, they were married yeah, at 18, yeah, yeah. arranged. A real love yeah, match. Yeah, exactly. And my grandmother, <laughs> my grandmother left school in the third grade to go work in her father's bakery, and she worked in a button factory her whole life. You know, right. she was, yeah. anyway, so my father was not an emotionally open person to his children at all. And the way that I connected to him was, by, was through watching the Giants. We used to watch football together. And that was, you know, it, it was a poignant kind of thing in a way. That was the way that I developed a, that was our safe place. Because he was a very volatile person and we all had volatile relationships with mm -hmm. him. And my safe place with him was sports. Uh -huh. And that I developed a love of sports from that, which is, sports is the greatest filler and yes. distraction, especially if you're a, a baseball fan, 160 nights a year, you got something to do. That's it's true. great. Like tonight. Like, like tonight, it's, exactly. it's a testament to your popularity that these people are not home watching the games. There are, are two of them. Are you pissed off about that, this guy right here? <laughs> now you're a Met fan. I could see it. I know. Okay, so your father was a little distant. And how about mother? He was more than a little distant. He was a narcissist. Uh, yeah, I think he had a narcissistic disorder. Yeah. yeah. My mother, um, you know, my mother came from a very... <laughs> A cultured background from from an artistic background. Yes. So you know she and that was great because she took us to theater all the time and museums and you know that kind of stuff, which was an, uh, I think seeing going to Broadway musicals was really important to me when I was a mm -hmm. kid. You know because I would just sit there and watch and be like, that's what I want to do. Except I couldn't sing or dance, so that didn't work out. <laughs> But I did, you know, that was my first, and they, they always had every cast album, and you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I just remember listening to the pajama game and My Fair Lady, and just like loving that whole world. And, um, but my mother, you see. Uh, when, you, when you see the, uh, something in the theater now, like a play or something, do you feel, I really would like to get up there and be an never. actress? Never, no, <laughs> no. Well, how did you get over it? 
One of the reasons people, could people ask me this, and I'm sure they ask you that, would you like to do theater? <laughs> and one of the reasons why I wouldn't, I mean, if a great part came along, I would love to do it. Right. However, first of all, what is it, eight, nine shows a week? Ugh. Eight. Eight shows a week? It's a lot. When you do stand-up, the way that I work and the way that you work, which is extremely spontaneous, we go on stage, we don't know what the hell we're doing from one minute to the next. We're mixing it up, we're changing things, we're making shit up all the time. That's our live experience. That, my live experience on stage is this, which is, by the way, extremely anxiety provoking, which we'll get to. Um, it, that's my experience on stage. Now to go on stage night after night saying the same things that somebody else wrote. Yeah, I know. And what if it's crap? I gotta say that same shit it's at true. night after night after night. I know. Sing that same song. Make fine tricks to make it interesting to myself. Well, may I say that that's the uh, Jeremy Piven why he got mercury poisoning. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I, 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 it's not to me creatively. It doesn't feel that interesting. Now, yeah. I'm sure if I had a great part and working with great people, well, you did a play. You enjoyed it. I did. I did a play called The Food Chain. By Nikki Silver, yeah. I played a suicide hotline operator. And you enjoyed it. You enjoyed the community <laughs> I did. of it. And I, I must say also that the uh, spontaneity is within the script also, because once you have the lines and you're working, it seems like you're making it up. And you find so a not new so thing awful. every yeah, night. It's not. But after three months, I had had it. I can't right. do more than that. That's enough. Anyway. So I think if I found something that I'd really like to do, I would do and also, you know, the other thing that's hard for me is coming off of Curb, which is so, it's at a level of funny, yeah. it's hard to come by. Right, and you don't have a script. No script. It's all improv, yeah. right? Yeah, it's all in the book, chapter 15. So, um, <laughs> there I mean, is a whole chapter. that's a pleasure. Yeah. And, and, to not and, have a script, you and just to have, talk. And to have the stuff yeah. that Larry gives me, when I read the outlines at the beginning of the season, we have an outline which is about seven pages long and each scene is delineated in about a paragraph of what's going on in each scene. Uh, for example, like the, the clip you just saw, um, uh, Susie comes in and invites Larry to dinner. Larry wants to know who's coming. Susie says she's not going to tell him. That's all that's written in the outline. Yeah. The rest we just make up and we just do the whole thing. Um, you know, so, uh, so Susie, uh, the, the, the Larry confronts Susie that she doesn't thank him for saving her life uh, diagnosing Lyme disease. That's all that's written. Uh -huh. The rest we just all. So coming off of that and. You, you know the bad sitcom scripts I get. Yeah. I can't do them. Now, not every actress likes to work like that because That's I, re right. I remember one time when I met Anne Bancroft and she had been a, uh, um, a on guest. On Curb, yeah. On Curb, and she was wonderful and she was a great actress, but she said she was petrified of the whole system. She needed to have her She kept her on script. saying to Larry, get, tell me what to say. Yeah. And what's interesting <laughs> is she's married to one of the great improvisers, was married to one yeah. of the great improvisers yeah. of all time. I mean, I know, Mel just could improvise yeah, like nobody's yeah. business. But, you know, the yin and the yang. Yeah. Like, so, for example, Jimmy couldn't improvise. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you were about to tell me about your mother a little bit more, I think. Yeah, I so what, what do you want to know? My, okay, here's an interesting thing. My mother was extremely competitive with her children. And is she here? Because if she's not, you can say this. Otherwise, I would really advise no, she's not against here, but my it. My sister is here, and she'll back me up. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, she, she just was. She was. She she was competitive. I you know I don't know why. Maybe Does she mother admit was, that to you? Uh, yes and no, but. Um, it's just, it was just in her nature. She's competitive. So there are certain women who are competitive with other women and certain women who see the sisterhood. Right. You know? And uh, when I first started doing stand-up, I had that part in me of the co competitive you with other women. You were imitating your mother. I was imitating my mother. And this little feminist uh, police over here <laughs> was the one, you were the one that really changed that for me, that made me realize that it's not us against each other, it's no. us against them. That's right. And that, you know, and that we really, and it was a boys club when we first started, yeah. I mean a real boys club, and that we had to stick together, and I really learned that lesson well from you, and have subsequently practiced that in my life. And I also think that you and I understood that together we were much stronger. Yeah, the boys seemed to stick together, they knew how to yeah. do it. In, in every every job that you talk about, women trying to break into the the, the glass ceiling, etc. The men are out playing golf and bonding and networking and the women are left out of it. So what are they doing? They're bonding with each other and helping each other. That, right. was, that was what I had observed. That's right. And I did learn that from you very well. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, let me see. You know, another thing about that, Joy, is 
when we were first starting, you know, they always, they, they, it was always people, friends of ours, that would say that it's such a sexist business and yeah. you can't get, I never found the stand-up business, I found the Hollywood television business sexist. I never found the stand-up business so sexist because to me, it was, uh, audiences are egalitarian. You get on stage, you make them laugh. If you make people laugh, a club owner's gonna put you on. That's true. That's true, but the audiences are, it's harder for a woman because over the years, men, they have not been used to seeing a woman do it. That's correct. So, so they're looking at you in this five minutes of just wary, and are you going to be able to do it? Are you going to be, are you going to be scared? Are they going to be embarrassed? You and know? you had to do the yeah. balance between the feminine and the tough, and, the, yeah. and it wasn't always well, easy. Well, you couldn't mix sex and comedy. That was a, that's always that's right. a mistake to do Couldn't dress too provocatively. Yeah, because then they get confused. But also, I also think that they do. <laughs> they don't true. know whether they, they want to laugh at you or fuck you. They're very confused, the guys. I think that the gay, a lot of gay women get, can make it, have an easier time in comedy. And a lot of the really of great female stand-ups are gay women. Yeah. Because they don't have that conundrum about the sexuality and the f being a feminine and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, but I also think that, you know, what people used to always say, it's so much harder for women. And it, it's harder for women in every walk of life, in every business. Is it easier for a mediocre man than a mediocre woman? Yes. Yes, but I didn't want to be mediocre. No, that's true. So you just, you know, you get over it. I, I hate victimizing in yeah. that way. But there they still aren't a lot of women doing it. There's not. Yeah. And I think it's because stand-up, stand-up is not like being, you know, Lucy or even being somebody like Lily Tomlin who was on your yes. show the other night, yeah. who was a sketch comedian. Stand-up is a very powerful art form. It's aggressive. You're standing there all by yourself, and it's aggressive and it's powerful. powerful position. And I think most women are not that comfortable with that kind of power, which is why there's so many great uh, lesbian comedians because they feel more comfortable in that yes. kind of power. And they're not interested in, in turning on a man. That's right. I mean, we do still have the conflict of wanting to be, you know, attractive and cute for the guys. So it's a little more difficult. And still being tough. Yeah. So if you're a lesbian, you don't have that issue. See um, why I prayed for lesbianism to I know, strike me? I can see your point. Um, <laughs> so you also, uh, also over the years, I, I remember you saying, I mentioned this to you before, that you couldn't wait to get older. Yeah. Now, explain yourself. Why do you want to get older? How, is there a cutoff point where you're not going to be happy to be getting older anymore? <laughs> 95. <laughs> um, and what are the things you like about it, and what are the things you don't like about it? Okay, the thing that I really like about it the most, mm -hmm. I don't give a shit what anybody thinks anymore. Yeah, that's good. You know, that's yeah. like the best that thing. Is, that's nice. I see my, my, my stepdaughters who are teenagers, and, you know, and they're beautiful. They're beautiful girls, yeah. and they're so self-conscious about every little thing they do. And the, I mean, Cindy yesterday says to me, she's wearing a black top with a, another thing in between and black leggings, and the blacks weren't exactly matching. Oh. You know, oh. and yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and there's almost a meltdown over the blacks not matching. And I, I remember that. I remember if my knee socks weren't even, I'd be freaking out, you know. Um, and, and just that whole self-consciousness and caring what people think and, and feeling like I, when I was younger, I felt so, I didn't fit in. When I, I remember, I went to SUNY College of Purchase when I was a freshman. When I was a senior in high school, uh, in like, let's say, April or something, I went to visit the school. I was, already knew I was going to go there. Yeah. And there was a girl with these brown, brown suede boots. Not these. But uh, brown suede lace-up boots. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling like I have no idea how to dress as a college kid. And I went out and bought those exact same boots because some girl at the college had them. You know, that kind of yeah. self-consciousness and not fitting in and, and thinking that everything you did was wrong. And I was so intimidated by the theater students, by the way, at mm -hmm. college. Yeah. I was just so intimidated by them. Oh, they're very them. erudite. Yes, and they all had white scarves theatrical. around their neck yeah. and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so it, with aging, besides the fact that, you know, your cartilage wears away and you need a hip replacement, um, which there sucks, that. and the aches and the pains and the, and the four pounds that I can't take off, and the hot Just flashes four? and That's the dry vagina, besides that, <laughs> besides that, I, I just feel more in my skin. I just yeah. feel so much more in Do my skin. Do you take criticism better now? Yeah, I think I take criticism uh -huh. better. I, I, I ignore it. I don't read all the right-wing blogs. I hear that they hate me on the right-wing blogs. I don't want to hear it, right? You don't want to hear Of course they hate you on the right-wing blogs, I like blogs, it in a way. Joy. It's like being on Nixon's enemies list. Yeah, it is. 
Yeah, I, I don't. I, I like don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. I don't want to read reviews. I don't want to hear anything negative. Mm -hmm. And people will sometimes think they're doing you a favor yeah. by telling you a negative thing that's online or something. And uh, no, 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 no. Uh, don't, don't, don't tell us. We don't want to hear it. But yeah, that's why I yeah. like getting older. I just feel that there's tremendous freedom mm -hmm. of you know that now I'm that crazy old woman on the street yelling at kids to pick up their litter. I've become her. And what was the other thing you were telling us about? Oh, your, there was your, this kid. I, I was in, uh, this a couple of years ago, I was in one of these little <laughs> newspapers. Yeah, you see, flash. that's not the good part. I've been having, I've had hot flashes for 15 years. It's ridiculous. She has. Um, there was this kid in a, in a, in a little newspaper, <laughs> yeah. you know, little newspaper store, yeah. magazines and newspaper and lottery tickets. And he was maybe 16. He was with all his friends from high school. And he buys a pack of cigarettes and he lights one up in the store. So I said, would you mind putting that out? We're in very close quarters here. Mm -hmm. And he mouths off at me like some cocky thing and all his friends start laughing. I said to him, listen kid, I'm gonna do you a favor now <laughs> and tell you something, okay? When you act like that, women assume you have a really small inadequate penis. <laughs> And like his mouth just dropped and the kid, the friends were just like, <laughs> and then I just walked out, you know? <laughs> but it's true. Now, what about the eye rolling that oh, you've the experienced? Eye roll. My kids eye roll at me now. I was queen of the eye rolls, okay? I was so good at it, you could actually hear my eye rolls. And now I have become, I mean, it's, a, it's the first chapter in the book where I talk about when you have teenagers, you know, I always thought I was hip and cool and I worked in nightclubs and I'm on an HBO show where I say fuck and, you know, and all of a sudden you have teenagers and you become an idiot, you know? Yeah. They think you don't know anything, they think you're a moron. It's just annoying. Did you ever think that you would end up as this uh, character, though? Because I remember years ago, Rodney Dangerfield, before you had That's it, right. he used to say, he told you you should be the Andrew Dice Clay of, the of That's women. That's right. He was very prescient, He called me up one day and he's like, Essie! I got a great idea for you. And he told me that it should be, but I, I think it was more uh, that, that Rodney just wanted to write those filthy jokes from a female point of view. Rodney loved to write jokes. He yes. was a great writer. Yes. Um, it wasn't, and, and I had no interest in doing that. I was just trying to figure out who I was. I didn't want to take on somebody else's persona and make it female. No, I never dreamed of, of becoming beloved for telling people to go fuck themselves. <laughs> I, I, that was not in my plan. Well, the plan. New York Observer called you fantastic and says, she's taken female cursing to longshoreman levels, <laughs> pummeling her bub bumbling barrel-bodied husband with potty mouth invectives like you fat fuck. Yeah. <laughs> That's from the New York Observer. That well, is quite a know. compliment, Missy. They would know. <laughs> Uh, no, I never planned. I mean, this character, the interesting thing about Susie Green is that Larry and I never discussed the character. You know, he told he me that. He saw it. He saw it. Well, he told me that first episode where I had to, he just said to me, I want you to rip Jeff a new asshole. Uh -huh. So I did, because I'd been in a relationship before. It was nothing new to me. And... Um, but you know that in real life, I was never, I'm not no, really, I mean, no. don't push me. No, but, no, you know. no, you're not really like no, that. No, I'm not really like that. Um, and so, the, the I just, I don't know, I walked into the house we were shooting in, and it was very modern decor, and this character just came to me, the way she dressed, and she's so secure, you know what I mean? She's so absolutely certain in her, her opinions of everything, and she thinks she looks fabulous, and she has the best taste, and she's just, you know, she has no doubt whatsoever, and she's it's totally It's kind of reactive. like psychotic high self-esteem. Exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And she just came to me, and I just began doing her, and Larry never discussed it with me. He just got what I was doing and started writing for her, and I got what he wanted me to do and just was doing it more, and it just developed. But I don't think he ever discussed any of our characters with any of us. Mm -hmm. He's not like that. He's not, you know, your motivation. What do you, Alan is like that, too. He doesn't discuss. He just casts you. He just casts right. you. Right. And that's the trick, isn't it? Yeah. But there were always seeds of this character in your work, because remember, that's right. remember Shecky Green? That that's night? right. That's right. We, we were at, a, tell them that story. We were at some... It was like a JCC, I think, somewhere. It might have been, or a country and club. And it was an old, we were young at that point. Not really? And, uh, no, well, it was, a long, it was about 25 yeah, years ago. Yeah, younger. About 24 years ago. Okay, younger. And <laughs> younger than springtime. And um, it's an old crowd. It was a very old crowd. Mm -hmm. And we're up there doing stand-up, and there's... Uh, 
And I finally got hostile with them. I just looked at them. I said, you want Shecky Green? Pay Shecky Green prices. And I stormed <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, we used to make, you have to understand how little money we used to make. We used to make for, on a weekday, it was, they call it cab fare. They give us seven bucks. Seven dollars, right. Seven dollars for a set. Then on the weekends, they would give us maybe 40, right? No, 20. 20? Uh, well, That's right. A company no one ever they got would give 40. us 20. Yeah. Catch used to give us 50. Well, Catch paid more, and then you'd get 100 if you if MC'd. MC'd. So I would run around. You, well, you did too. I did it more than you, that running around stuff. I did it plenty, but yeah. then, then it was your turn to do it. Yeah. We'd run around, <laughs> do six, seven sets a night. Yeah, but there were Six, times seven when you'd, sets a night, you'd and then be, I'd make my rent, you know? Yeah, well, you'd be at, uh, first you'd be at Catch, then you'd be at the Improv, then you'd be at Folk City. Right, right. Then, uh, the some, Duplex. Uh, the Duplex. Green Street. And then Green Street. And by the time you're at Green Street, I'd be saying, did I tell you I was a teacher? Right. <laughs> right. You forget because you're doing 15, 20 minute sets. Right. And then we'd like to go to Green Street because they'd feed us. Yeah, that's right. You know, so that's we try true. to end up there yeah. a certain time of night because they would feed us like a nice goat cheese salad. And we or something. never did the road because the road is just hideous. I mean, it's the loneliest people get on drugs when they do the yeah. road. And also develop bad habits, uh, not just drug habits, but bad comedic <laughs> habits where you're you're dealing with you know the cross section of America, and they would dumb down their acts. Yeah. And to stay in New York, uh, but you'd make money on the road. You'd but make we didn't money, do it. not but much. To me, I'd rather do seven sets a night and stay in New York. Well, we also had the benefit. Of Ruth Stern, let's remember Ruth yes. Stern. Do any Oliver people Shalom. might know her, Oliver Shalom? Yeah, <laughs> as I said, Bonanima in Italian. <laughs> she she booked every goddamn yeah. Jewish country club yeah. in the tri-state area. Shaka Maxin, tell them some of them. They probably Pine know. Hollow, everyone, and we did them all. See, when we used to get, but well, we used to get really <laughs> bad money. I mean, it was good money at the time. We'd get like. Two hundred and fifty dollars a night. Yeah, well, five hundred. I got yeah. I, 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 five hundred dollars was so much yeah, money was, for one night, it. and that right. was just one night out of the month. Yeah, and then you could make another five hundred another time, and it started to accumulate. Yeah, and Joy really, used to teach comedy club classes. I did everything. Yeah, psychodrama groups. Right. Yeah. Right. Comedy, oh, everything, did. yeah. I mean, we just... Well, like, at it, one point, I, I had a, uh, a, cr a fork in the road. I was either going to be a psychotherapist or a comic. And I went to the Postgraduate Center for Psychoanalytic Theory. Right. And um, I said, no, this is not funny enough. <laughs> and I also think that, you, that, you, that there was a confusion of listening to your friends and listening to strangers. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because I don't know how they don't just get up and say, you're boring the shit out of me! <laughs> well, they fall asleep a yeah. lot of times. Okay, so before we take questions from the audience, just let's wrap this up with, you know, what do you want to do next? Let's say Curb... It should only stay on the air another 10 years. I would like to But do let's it. say it doesn't, or let's say it does, and you have another opportunity. What would you like to do now? Do you hmm. want to be in a movie? Hmm. Do you want to... Uh, you know, I enjoy... I do enjoy acting. My... Okay, fantasy job. Yes. If I had a fantasy job, it would be to be a... To have a great character, a cop, a shrink, a DA, or something, in a really well-written drama that shoots in New York. Sure. That could be like a funny-ish character. A dramedy. A dramedy. Because I can't do a comedy <laughs> after, I mean, I can, but it better be fucking funny no, after but doing you, you, Curb. You can't, it's, it's not hard. the same. It's First hard. of all, sitcoms have laugh tracks. They're so yeah. annoying. So fantasy You need an job, HBO show. An HBO, HBO show, show. That, that I could be funny, but also do some acting and still be serious that shoots here. That's I don't fantasy. know if people realize this, but Susie also played a Hasidic Jew in a... In a mm -hmm. uh, a Hallmark Hall in a of Fame. Hallmark Hall of Fame, yes. And uh, she got into a little trouble with the uh, Orthodox. Little? Well, you came, she came on The View and uh, said something about how they look. And they no, turned, Barbara said to me, what ahead, did you them. learn about the Hasidim? And I said that they're not the greatest dressers. It yeah. was a joke. <laughs> Yeah. It was a joke, okay? So they, they got really pissed On off every at her. On com is calling me an anti-Semite. They actually were saying she was anti-Semitic. And then it turned out that the head of this whole oh, thing... Oh, the, the, the guy who started the whole thing, the rabbi called me up. You have to fix this, and, da, 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 and you have to make this better. And I was like, Rabbi, I'm, I didn't mean to offend you. I really didn't. I was making a, I'm a comedian. I was making a joke. <laughs> he was like, well, you have to... I said, what do you want me to do? I, 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 we want to do a Hasidic fashion show on The View. Yeah. <laughs> and believe me, they entertained the possibility over there. 
because they have to fill a lot of air time, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, okay, so here's a question from Tampa, Florida. Apparently we're all over the place. Tampa, Florida? You yeah. know, you and I can't go to Tampa, Florida for one very good reason. Exactly, somebody just the said, hair. yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. It's just, no, worse is Dallas. Dallas, oh, I hate Dallas. I was there one time and then I realized the last time a Democrat was in Dallas, he was shot. <laughs> okay. Susie, do you feel intelligent, self-supporting women will continue to want to marry in the future? Yes, I do think that intelligent, yes, I do, because, you know, something that you and I have talked about many times is a lot of the women that we know who are intelligent, self-supporting are not married to rich guys. That's true. You know, we don't like rich guys. No, we don't like rich guys. They're the kinds of guys, narcissists, well, they that call out their own you. name they when they're coming. You, you know, unless they're, they're very generous. Yeah, um, yeah no, they, they're controlling <laughs> yeah. and they want little wifey and we don't want to well, be little wifey. They may not want little wifey, but it's their money that you're spending and it feels controlling right. to and, me. And actually, and I tell my girls this, uh, financial dependence is the kiss of death. I really believe that in a yeah. relationship. Yeah. Now, it's not always possible because you have kids and right. it's not easy. Yeah. But um, yeah, sometimes I, it can work. I mean, I have a friend who's a playwright, and she never worked right. a day in her life, and she keeps writing plays, and her husband gives her whatever she wants, and she's very happily married, and they have a real partnership. I mean, but he's an unusual guy. Too, yeah, you have to have a guy like yeah. that. Yeah. But I do think that 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 uh, it's that's not the reason to get married necessarily. You know, I got married a year ago. I was 53 years old. I got married for the first time. You know, at 53, give some people out there hope. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, you I didn't can get married at any age. You just can't have the list that, that every single thing has to be perfect on the list. Don't expect them to be like your girlfriends yeah. or your gay friends. And a man is really not capable of being no, everything exactly. to you. Neither so, is a friend. Okay. But so so they, I think they can, but they have to. They, there's different reasons to get married. It's nice to grow old with somebody. Okay, I have a question for me. Who's going to break the fall? This, oh, oh, for both of us. Yeah. Let's do both of us first. What comedians do you like? Again, comedian is an actress. A comedian is a, is a stand-up. But which comics, I guess she means, which do we like? Female, female comics? Yeah. yeah. You. Yeah, You're okay. my favorite female. Right. No, you are. You're my favorite female oh, comic. Oh, stop it. She is. Get off of me. Um, I'm going to forget people. <laughs> I, I, I think Wanda Sykes is very funny. She's funny. And She's going like, to be on my show next week, by And the you way. know what? Yeah. A woman in late night. Let's see how she did. She has a new show on Fox, yeah. Late Night. So, oh, yeah. you know, they don't put women in Late Night. Um, you know, it's well, funny. My show, I, my show, my new show on HLN is on at midnight and it's on at 9 o'clock. It repeats at midnight. The 12 o'clock does better than the 9. Because, and that's interesting to me because they've always said that when women don't work in late night television, I'm right. up against a lot of the guys. Right. I'm not saying I'm beating them because, I mean, they have network shows. Right. This is a cable show. But, but what's interesting about that yeah. also, Joy, is that your show is not a comedy show. Yeah. You know, they think women, you, you have credibility as, as a journalistic kind of a person. They think that women can't be funny late at night. Yeah. Well, funny when you're forcing it. You yeah. Mean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um... Okay, this is, uh, do you curse at, a lot at home? Someone wants to know. Do I curse know. a lot? Eh, you know, you bang into something, you say, oh, shit. I, yeah. Uh, no, but uh, you don't talk like Susie Green. No, Grant. I don't talk like Susie Green. No. Um, do we have questions from the audience? Oh, those are the questions from the audience? No, these are the questions from people out in the stratosphere somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. From who, Tampa. From Tampa. And, and, from and Temple Benatia, Rome. The in was the Rochester. <laughs> Yeah. Rockville Center. Someone yes, wants to, here. Yeah, okay. Yes, ma'am. I love your show at 9 o'clock. Yeah. We know what you're going to say. Time Warner. I know. That's why I'm telling... What happens at 9 o'clock on my show on HLN is that Time Warner, I guess, made a deal with HLN and CNN... And, and so they interrupt it, and, and you lose a whole chunk of the show. So I would suggest you watch it on HDL if you have it, 7.58 in New York, or 12 o'clock. It doesn't happen at midnight. Maybe that's why the numbers are higher. It's, it's a very, dis you're right, it's very disruptive It's annoying, when you're but there's nothing it. I can do about and it. And like, how, how much can you watch Louis Dodley? You know, for Louis Dodley, the New York One guy that's doing the update all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, yeah, behind the scenes kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. 
He was faking. He was faking. No, you, you know, the thing you have to understand about Curb is nothing happens without Larry's approval. So he controls every aspect of that show. So they go to him and they say, we'd like Susie to do behind the things with the camera. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Then they show him cuts of it, and he has to approve every cut of it. So him saying, oh, I don't like what you become, that's all a joke. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes? Shout it out. Oh, yeah. There were no women featured in the New York, New York Comedy, Comedy Festival. Festival. I noticed that in the ads. What can we do? Well, we don't want to do it. Yeah. We didn't want to do it. I'm sure we would have done it because our friend Louis Miranda We've done Miranda it before. It. We've done New yeah, York Yeah, we've Comedy done Festival. it. Maybe this year they just didn't have anybody available to do it who was on the level I mean, I know Sarah wanted. Silverman has done it before. We've done it before. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the truth of the matter is there are many, many more male comedians than women, com right. female comedians. It's just a fact. Yeah. So not that it's a but good there thing. Are, you, the, you're saying the same thing we were saying before. There aren't that many women comedians. I still don't know the reason. It's still, I guess, harder for them to do it. You know, that's the problem. What can we do? Just keep doing what we do. Yes, ma'am. Stand up, please. Yell it out. Oh, okay. Carrie's my, my, my fabulous editor from Simon & Schuster. For the book, What Would Susie Say? Bullshit Wisdom About Love, Life, and Comedy. I'll be signing outside and selling. <laughs> my favorite episode? I have a few favorite episodes. The Doll is my all-time favorite episode for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because, you know, what's more fun than saying, get me the fucking head? Um, <laughs> Uh, and that was when I just looked up and I saw Einstein under the light, know, you know, it's scary, he's revered yeah. in the Jewish community. Spinoza. Um, uh, another reason is because that's when Larry established that the spaghetti western music as my theme, as the intimidating Susie Green theme, and I love that I have that. And, and then also, that's, that was the first time really that, that, um, Larry, that you saw Larry and Jeff just cowering at Susie Green, living in fear of Susie Green, and, and what's more fun than that, really? You know, I see my doctor here, and I'm wondering if he also didn't graduate from high school. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a flash of panic. <laughs> what did you learn in high school that you need to know as a doctor? I don't Nothing. know. Nothing. How to, how to, uh, geometry? What do I know? Stand up, sir. <laughs> yes you know it's interesting that you should ask that because I addressed that very issue in chapter 15 so read it <laughs> she's got to make up that advance you know what I'm saying okay yes ma'am she's we've been on the she's been, been on the, the many you times. mean on this to panel I know. I they, would never, he used to, they would never put us together. They might for a day. Well, for a day, yeah. but not permanently because they would say too they Jewish. They think we're the same person in the business. They, they would say it's too, even though she's not, they would say it's too Jewish. Even Larry David, I said to him when he was on my show a couple of weeks ago, did you happen to see him by any chance? He was really great, wasn't he? He's so funny. And I said to him, how come you never asked me to be on Curb? And he said, Susie. <laughs> I said, oh, we're the same person, I guess. So everybody thinks that we're the same people. Yes. You know, in the, it, 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 do you like it? Yeah. Um, I didn't work with any of them, so I wasn't around. Um, but I, I think it was kind of a fun thing. I mean, it was, it, 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 the thing that I really like about it is because it will bring so many new viewers to the right. show that are going to see it because they're Seinfeld people and they'll come watch Curb and then they'll go back and see Curb. Because, you know, Curb doesn't have the kind of audience that Seinfeld had. It's just an HBO show. Um, it was, it was a, a good, I don't want to say gimmick. It wasn't a good gimmick. It was a, it was a good influx of energy. Right. Yes, sir? I don't, you know what? I don't know jokes. I don't do jokes. If anybody ever tells me a joke, I never remember it. Do you? No, I have no jokes. You just said that, so I'll say, go fuck yourself. I'm not telling you a joke. <laughs> Yes. 
Did she really have a brisket under her skirt? No, she did not really. That's, that's from a joke. Well, I'll tell a joke. I have this line in my act where I talk about, um, uh, you know, I've, I've always been thin. My mother's big Eastern European peasanty looking. She looks like if she lifted up a skirt, there'd be a huge brisket underneath there. <laughs> but no, that's a joke. <laughs> tell it to that guy. That's a joke. Yeah, there's your joke. <laughs> okay. That, yes, over there. All right, we'll come up there in a sec. Let him just answer. Go ahead. Your show is spontaneous. How long does it actually take to film an entire episode? About seven days. And we have really, really long days because we shoot lots and lots of takes. I, my scenes take longer because Larry giggles every time I yell and scream at him. <laughs> so we have to do my scenes are always like, you know, 25 takes. But we have to shoot a lot of coverage. It's called coverage. It's like, you know, two shot, one shot, because they have to do so much in the editing because it isn't scripted. So we do a scene that lasts sometimes, you know, 15 minutes. It's got to be cut down for three minutes because it's a 30-minute show. So it, we have a pretty luxurious schedule. Okay. Up there now. Somebody. Yes, ma'am. That was a great room. We that liked that room. room. Yeah, it was fabulous room. Um, you were awesome. But I also want to know if you have any um, tips about places to find, uh, say, men or you know, husbands. <laughs> well, you know what? When you least expect it, it's when you least expect it. I mean, I met Jimmy. Because Jimmy's gay brother was my, you know, one of my closest friends, but he never set us up together. He never thought I would go for this hick from upstate New York who lives 150 miles away with four kids. We just happened to be in the same place at the same time. Our friend Lewis used to always say to me, wear your sign. Yeah. You know, which is just be open. I know someone who met someone in a subway. All right, it was a, a homeless flasher, person. <laughs> <laughs> Things are tough. Yeah. Uh, I would just say, you know, uh, you got to try everything. I don't know. J-date. <laughs> Anybody else up there? No. Okay. Anyone else have a question? No. Yes, yeah, somebody's over there. Okay. Point. Oh, there. Yeah. Don't be shy. No. No, because, you know, you, first of all, if you can't come up with something, you could always cut and it's not live. But it's, never, it's actually never happened. You know, if you're, if you're in the scene... If you know what the scene is about, and you're in the scene, and you know what you're, it, it's not, one of the important things about Curb is most of the uh, actors don't see the outlines. I see the outlines, and Jeff sees the outlines. But Larry doesn't want any of the guest actors to see the outlines, because he doesn't want them coming up with like funny lines, those kinds of horrible sitcom lines that people come up with. They show up on the set, this is all in chapter 15. They show up on the set, and he says, okay, this is what the scene you're doing is today. Christian Slater shows up. Um, you know, you're going to be eating caviar, and I'm going to tell you you're eating too much. You know, that's all they know. And if you're really in the scene, and you know what the scene is about, you're never at a loss for words. Like in real life, you're never at a loss for words. Well, maybe you are. I'm not. <laughs> <clears throat> Right. Are you a rabbi? <laughs> and then he's saying, "How we spontaneous say, could it be if you're doing 25 takes?" Got it. Yeah. It's uh, now spontaneous is the wrong word. Improvised is the word. So it's improvised, meaning that we don't have a script. We improvise the script. And then, you know, after, sometimes we find the scene in the first take, and sometimes it takes us several takes to find the scene, and we set it, and sometimes we do it the same way over and over again, and sometimes we throw in different stuff. And so, you know, sp spontaneous, look, when I get up on stage and I do my act, frequently I'm saying the same things, I, right, Harvey? The same things <laughs> I've said many, many times. He's seen me, both of us, 10,000 times. Yeah. But you do it spontaneously, that you make it feel like you're doing it for the first time. It's an it's acting, acting trick. It's an acting trick. The response of the other individuals, which we know what you said before, did you vary No, you, you, you make it, you, you, you act as though you're hearing it for the first time. You pretend you're hearing it for the They're first time. They're professionals. They know how to do it. Yes, sir. Don't try it at home. <laughs> Don't try it at home. <laughs> 
Okay. Yes, sir. You mean, how do I feel about being alone in my new show? I feel great. She loves it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not really. I'm really interested in, in just, I want to hear what the person is, is saying. I, I don't really have prepared material except questions and my own interest in the topic. And, and you know what, this is actually the same kind of thing as, as when you're yeah. actually listening to somebody... Yeah. And you're a funny person. The funny line comes out. Well, uh, Dom DeLuise, I once read here, he said that he had to work to feel safe. And once right. he felt safe, then he could be funny. So that's what you work to feel, comfortable and safe. And, and then your natural personality comes out, if you're listening. I, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. What a voice he has, this guy. I like him. He's yeah. in the same row as my doctor. <laughs> 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 He'll give you colonoscopy later. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> one night one night my gastroenterologist I was at Caroline's a couple of months ago was in the audience and Jimmy was there and I looked out and I saw my gastroenterologist and I said well my gastroenterologist is here and my husband is here at least we know one person in this audience has had their finger up my ass <laughs> you figure out which one <laughs> she's so delicate <laughs> I know it wasn't Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> we don't play that. Go ahead. S loud. Yeah. There were two vacancies on The View. Saw Jones, Meredith Vieira, Rosie O'Donnell. Three. Yeah. Right. You hear this up there? She's saying that the view um, went through some changes, and now we have Whoopi and Sherry, and she loves Whoopi. Go ahead. Yeah. She feels Sherry has been a disaster. I don't think so. I don't think so either. I don't agree with that. What does she bring to the table, you want to know? She, she's not for you. I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing about The View. Here's the thing about that show. Uh, uh, most people who watch that show identify with one of us. And that's how the show works. So maybe you identify with me, right? No. <laughs> All right, who do you identify with? None of them. Barbara. So what I'm saying is that there's a whole group of people out there who identify with Sherry. They had a husband who dumped them for another woman, had a baby with them, and then now she has to pay alimony, then she has a sitcom all about that. So that is her purpose And on the you show. know what? I also think, from my point of view as a more objective observer, Sherry's funny. She's, she's fun. very warm. She's very likable. I like her. Uh, you know, she, she comes from a, a very different background than most people in this audience. She's a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. And thus was brought up with a certain amount of ignorance that, that, no, she was. I'm not saying that, no, she was brought up not. In, this is getting dangerous. You I know what I'm nothing. saying. No, I, I meant, what I meant yeah, about no. that. All right, I put my foot in my mouth, surprise. What I meant was she was brought up not to, uh, not to educate herself about certain things because that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. So, so she comes across to you as maybe being, it, yeah, or, or, or a homophobic or whatever. But I don't think in, in her heart that she's she is. She's not homophobic. She's not at all. She's I don't think she is at she's all. She's a very open girl. She's got a lot of great qualities. That's right. I, I, really I like personally her. really like her a lot. Thank so do you. I. You know what I meant. Yes, I meant I that she was brought up in a very different background than some, you know. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses are, they have certain restrictions. They, she doesn't believe in Halloween. You know, she's, as a child, I mean, they think it's spooky, you know, and uh, the whole thing. It is spooky. I hate Halloween. I despise Halloween. <laughs> and I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I've never even and done jury think, duty. 
I, I, I also think that, that, in answer to that also, I also think that it's important to have those different points of view on a show like that. That's right. That you and don't want, look, you got Elizabeth, you got Joy, you got, you know, you don't want every Upper West Side, you know, liberal to be on the same show. Then you're on Air America. No. This is uh, ABC. Even on my show at, at, um, at HLN, I had Ann Coulter on recently, and I got, I took a lot of shit from progressives like you in this room. And I, you know, it's like, what am I going to only have people who say what I think? I don't, I don't like that. Right. It's not as interesting. Yeah. Although I did, I did turn down Sean Hannity to be on his show just because I thought I would just be nauseous just yeah. looking at That's him. Right. I couldn't. I don't have to go on their show. Yeah, right. But when they come on my show, I like to question them. Yes. Would you want me to blacken her eye? <laughs> She is a guest on the show, you know. You have to have, be gracious. Part of the thing that, part of my technique is to let them hang themselves. He said okay. I was too easy on uh, Ann Coulter. Fuck him. <laughs> I'm sick of this whole audience now. The only one I still like is my doctor. And your accountant. <laughs> yeah, and Harvey, that's it. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, a question for Joy. Yeah. Um, in the <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. The, wait, wait. There's two people up asking questions at Sit the Sit down same for time. a minute. <laughs> Sit down for a minute. We'll get to you in a second. Go ahead. Question for Joy. Yeah. How do you like Fred Armisen's impersonation? Have you had a chance to speak to him about that? They imitate me on Saturday Night Live. Fred Armisen, naturally, it's a guy. <laughs> but I think it's very funny. I think that he really captured my twitchiness and my, so what, who cares? Which is basically my philosophy of life. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's another version of don't sweat the small stuff. You know, so what, who cares? In fact, everyone in my office, my girl, one of the girls at the office has a two-year-old kid and she's trained him to say, so what, who cares? So what, who cares? <laughs> And, and, and now, now she's got him doing it in different ways. So now we go, so what, who cares? <laughs> He's two. It's great. Okay, now you. <laughs> what, yes. <laughs> okay, did you hear that up there? If she were president, what would she have said to Dick Cheney without dithering, which is Cheney's word? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what more is there to say I to Dick Cheney? End on that, Shall we end on that? Thank you all very much. Thank you, Susie. She'll be signing books, as she told you. Thank you, Susie and Joy the funniest ladies of comedy.